American Cetacean Society conducts a biannual international conference to bring renowned cetacean scientists and the public together to further our knowledge about whales, dolphins, and porpoises. It was scheduled for San Diego in November 2020, but postponed due to the coronavirus <coughs> epidemic. Instead of the live conference and group whale watching, the international conference has gone virtual on January 30th, 2021. We will return to the Kona Kai in San Diego in November 2022 for the next live conference. The American Cetacean Society is excited to introduce J. Jim Hans Thiewissen, PhD's talk on From Land to Water, The Walking Whales. A native of the Netherlands, he holds degrees in biology and geology from the University of Utrecht and the University of Michigan. He is professor of anatomy and neurobiology at the Northeast Ohio Medical University where he holds the Ingalls Brown Endowed Chair in Anatomy. He teaches anatomy and embryology to medical students and also has appointments at Kent State University and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Hans does research on whale paleontology, anatomy, and embryology, and he has traveled the world to study fossil and living whales. In Pakistan, he was the first to find a whale ancestor that could walk on land, Ambolyticus natans. And in India, he discovered the first skeletons of Indohyus, the closest land animal related to whales. His work with the sense organs of modern bowhead and beluga whales in Alaska have implications for management of endangered whale populations. He has published more than 100 scientific papers, nine of which are in the prestigious journals Science and Nature. He is a co-editor for the Marine Mammal Encyclopedia, now in its third edition, and for the bowhead whale, Balania mysticetus, Biology and Human Interactions. His popular book about the origin of whales, The Walking Whales, has been translated into Korean and Japanese. And we're back, and let's see if we can bring Hans on here, just a second. Hello. My Hi, Hans. You got it. Hello, good. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. It was good to actually. Well, last we saw it, it was it seems so long ago. We saw each other in at Barcelona. That's right. We talked. That was a while ago. Um, so no, we're thrilled to have you here. So uh, I got my I got my little pacasitis right here on the <laughs> model here. So that's no, exciting. We're really going delving into the history part of our uh, of our our of our theme here, conference theme. So. It's wonderful. I'm going to have you uh, momentarily, uh, Square, you just going to share your screen here. All right. Thank you. Well, I've heard a bunch of very interesting talks so far. A lot of the pressing news about cetacean populations, um, but good work on conservation. But also lots of light points about people who are engaged with their subject. And maybe most important, as I look for similarities, which, which is what I'm going to talk about, is that there's a lot of good science and that data is important and inspire people. That's really maybe the most important point of what I'm going to talk about too. For me, the research I'm going to present is, is not related to whale conservation, it's related to cetacean evolution. Um, and that too, of course, in the US at least, is a mildly controversial uh, subject with all the creationism issues that there are. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so here you see a bowhead whale jumping out of the water north of Alaska. And as you look at this animal, it's not very obvious that this is a mammal. It's got a torpedo shaped form, which mammals don't have. It has no hair that you can see, which mammals usually have. It's forelimb, it has a flipper, and then you don't see the tail fluke, but that's not very mammal-like either. So that's kind of interesting to think about. Indeed, people have known that whales, that cetaceans were mammals ever since Aristotle, who noticed that they nursed their young. 
but that was the scientist. It wasn't regular people. The people who knew Wales best for most of uh, our history are, uh, were the people who hunted them. So I'm going to give you, read you this nice quote, this long quote from Herman Melville's Moby Dick. In the system of nature, A.D. 1776, Linnaeus declares, I hereby separate the whales from the fish. But of my own knowledge, I know that down to the year 1850, sharks and shad, alewives and herring, against Linnaeus' express edict, were still found dividing the possession of the same sea with the Leviathan. The grounds of which, upon which Linnaeus would fain have banished the whales from the waters, he states as follows. On account of their warm bilocular heart, their lungs, their movable eyelids, their hollow ears, spinam and trantum caminam, mamam lactantes. I submitted all of this to my friend Simeon Meishi and Charlie Coffin of Nantucket, those messmates of mine in a certain voyage, and they united in the opinion that the reasons set forth were altogether insufficient. Charlie profanely hinted that they were humbug. Be it known that, waiving all argument, I take the good old-fashioned ground that the whale is a fish and call upon holy Jonah to back me. So this is 1851, a few years before Darwin's book. Um, most people in the world feel that, that whales are fish. The scientists have some anatomical arguments why they are mammals. But uh, habitat or ecological, whatever you want to call them, um, arguments clearly point that they are fish. Stuff gets worse with the origin of species eight years later. In its first edition, actually, Darwin has some thoughts about how whales might have evolved, and here they are. So this is the first edition of the Origin of Species. In North America, the black bear was seen by Hearn swimming for hours with a widely open mouth, thus catching, like a whale, insects in the water. Even in so extreme a case as this, if the supply of insects were constant, and if better adapted competitors did not already exist in the country, I can see no difficulty in a race of bears being rendered by natural selection more and more aquatic in their structure and habits with larger and larger mouth, till a creature was produced as monstrous as a whale. Of course, black bears don't do this. This observation is incorrect. Hearn was a uh, naturalist who mostly lived in uh, Canada, and it's, but, but Darwin does quote him correctly here. Um, Darwin got a lot of grief for this statement. Um, in uh, a few years later, he writes to his friend, it's laughable how often I've been attacked and misrepresented about this bear. And in the later edition of, editions of the origin of species, the statement gets shorter and shorter, and eventually, by the end of his life, the last edition, there's no more talk about the origin of whales in the book of Darwin. So let's step back. It was very difficult for people to believe that whales were mammals, with evolution, it would mean that whales actually had land ancestors. So there were ancestors that slowly moved back to the water. So let's think of a human analog for that. Let's take a very fancy car like the Batmobile that you see there, and a very fancy submarine like the yellow submarine that you see there, and give a bunch of engineers the task to take that Batmobile and make a submarine out of it would basically be impossible, right? It would be totally different systems that would have to evolve. But that's actually what whales have done. And it's one step worse, because not only were they able to, could the engineers take this car apart to make uh, now a sub uh, or an aquatic uh, vehicle, actually all the intermediates would have to be functional animals or functional vehicles in this vehicle, in this vehicle comparison basically very hard to conceive. So whales were really one of the proud examples while evolution could not be true. People could not conceive that that could be really happened. Fossil record didn't help. Up to about the mid nineties, the earliest whales for which full skeletons were known was this animal, Basilosaurus, known from mostly from Egypt and from North America. And basically, this looks like a whale. It had a fluke, it had a long streamlined body, it had flippers, 
Um, it actually had tiny little hind limbs, but people didn't know that. Way too small to walk on anyway. And you see its head sort of looks weird. There's no modern whale that has a head like that, but this would clearly be recognized as a whale. There were no fossil intermediates known. So the creationists had a field day with this. So what was known was um, that there were baleen whales and tooth whales that probably had a common ancestor around 40 million years ago. And here you see the basilosaurids that I just talked about. Um, baleen whales, of course, characterized by this big plate, this big uh, row of baleen plates. This is a bowhead whale on the beach, upside down. So this is the upper jaw, the lower jaw is missing. Um, so we did know that baleen had to originate somewhere here. You don't see the date anymore, but this is about this line here is about 40 million years ago because these earlier cetaceans did not have baleen. So that's where baleen originated. Toothed whales, of course, echolocate. And the thought is also that echolocation also originate, originated around 40 million years ago when the oldest tooth whales are known. What we didn't know much about is these animals in the red oval. They are the Eocene whales between roughly you know, 55 million and 40 million years old. And the old name for them is uh, the Arcuseeds. And like I said, the only ones for which we had full skeletons were in the orange tree basal sorts. You didn't know much about that. We also didn't know much about which animals whales were most closely related to on land. So those are the two question marks I'm going to fill in for you today. There was a bunch of molecular data that had, that had started to come out in the 1950s, and it stated that cetaceans are really artiodactyls. Artiodactyls like camels, pigs, giraffe, deer, um, cows, and goats, and, and, uh, and hippos, and the molecular similarities indicated that whales, cetaceans, were closely related to the artiodactyls, and then the modern molecular data indicated them that they are most closely related to hippo. Artiodactyls and cetaceans. The fossil evidence did not point that way. Like I said, there was no good skeletons for these animals. We did have dental uh, evidence. So here you see a lower molar of an Eocene artiodactyl. It's got sort of a higher part in the front and a lower part in the back with four bumps, four cusps. An Eocene whale had teeth like this, much higher, and only two cusps, not four, like here. And there was a group of mammals in the Eocene that had teeth quite like that, and they are called Mesonychids. So most paleontologists before 2001 believed that these carnivorous mesonychids were the closest relatives to whales. So that's kind of an awkward inconsistency. The DNA was talking about hippos. The fossils were talking about mesonychids. Could it be that both are true? Because DNA can only tell you what the most closest extant relative is, maybe that's hippos, maybe these fossil animals are much closer related to whales, but since we don't have DNA, we can't show it. Okay, the critical bone that it came down to was this bone. This is a bone from the ankle of artiodactyls. It's a highly unique shape. This is a bone, uh, it's called the astragalus or the talus, and I compared it here to a dog, and you see that there's sort of a a pulley part on the top. Everybody has that. Every mammal has that. But at the bottom, in most mammals, there is this sort of uh, rounded shape, whereas in artiodactyl, there is a second pulley. If whales were artiodactyls and not mesonychids, they should have an astragalus like this. But we don't. Whales don't. This, since it's a bone from the ankle, since we didn't have fossil hind limbs in whales, we didn't know what the whales looked like. Okay, so the problems that we had in the mid 90s was that we needed more fossils that documented the transition from land mammals, which would then also answer the question, hopefully, 
to which animals these were related to. And the bottom line of what you do then is that you need to do more field work. So this is the mid 1990s. Um, and since then, really a lot of work has been done, not just by me, but by a lot of other people. And we've, we've really filled out, answered both of these questions in some detail. Um, so we now, now I would say that whale origins is one of the better documented major transitions uh, documented by the fossil record. So I'm first going to give you a brief, a couple of slides about uh, what field work is actually like. So as Uko said, or as, as the introduction said, I worked in Pakistan and India, work in three places. Uh, red is Pakistan, the yellow and orange are India, Western India. This is what Pakistan uh, looks like, uh, Northern Pakistan arid environment, of course, that's good because fossils, you don't want plants to grow on top of your fossils, so aridity is good for looking for fossils. Um, we always work with local um, colleagues um, and also with local uh, protection often. These are uh, uh, policemen from the Northwest Frontier Province in Pakistan that uh, carry automatic uh, weapons and they accompany us, and, but they're really more an interface with local people since I don't speak the local language. We started finding fossil whales there. Um, this is my student Sandy Mader, founding, uh, uh, who has excavated a block of rock here, and you can maybe recognize a vertebra here with a bone next to it. This is actually a pelvis of a fossil whale, and here you see the entire whale as it was excavated in my lab on a table. Um, this is India, then Western India. Um, you can already see, this is, the, this, is, this is the region of Kutch, that from the air, you can see these different colors. Those are actually colors of the rock. Um, so you can do a lot of geology just looking at aerial photos. Uh, this white is not rock, that's actually salt. Uh, the, these ocean arms dry up, and this is the run of Kutch. Some of you may, you may be familiar. There's a field vehicle, and in the, this place in India is also very arid, so also uh, great to see a lot of uh, surface where you can collect fossils. And here's two of my students crawling, um, looking for fossils. This might be a fossil you find. You see a bunch of ribs on this side and another bunch of ribs on this side. So you might be hoping that in here there will be a vertebral column and in here there might be a skull of a fossil animal. Unfortunately, in this case, that was not the case. We dug this up and all there was was ribs. Uh, disappointing. But sometimes you do better here. We dug up a skull. You see it marked by the ice pick and I'm digging up the side of the hill to excavate it better. And eventually you end up with a whole bunch of little pieces of bone that you take home and glue together. Um, it has its challenges working there. This is a lunch. We're sitting in the hot sun having a lunch. You might wonder why we're not sitting in the shadow of those trees. Well, that's where the flies hang out. It's hot for them too. So we prefer the sun. Um, local, local people here are mostly nomads with tents and they own camels. Uh, you just see the owner here. Um, so that's there's not much uh, that you can there's not much agriculture or anything. So it's a very pleasant place to work. Desert. And here you see another shot of uh, a specimen that uh, uh, Lisa Cooper and Lauren Stevens are excavating. One more. This is a skull of a dugonget. There is all marine rocks, so most of the mammals we find, we find much, lots of fish, but also cetaceans and quite a few uh, sirenians. So here are three of the skeletons we found, and these three are actually all three from Pakistan, uh, different sizes. Um, but you see they're pretty, there's a lot of skeletal coverage. Uh, down here, there's a hammer for scale. Okay, so let's go through the fossil record, the first 8 million years of Cetacean evolution. Um, and I'm going to go through these 
from the bottom of the cladogram to the top, and I'm just going to number them because I don't want to bother you or confuse you with all these different names. So I'm going to call these acts in a play, act one through, one through six, and then act seven is the ones that we talked about already, these basilosaurids, and the next act eight would be baleen whales and toothed whales. Act one, an artiodactyl called Indohyus indiri. So here's a skeleton. This is um, a land animal um, that, however, also spent time in water, but certainly not in seawater. Um, basically the size of a cat um, with long limbs, about 49 to 42 million years and only known from India and Pakistan. Why is this a cetacean relative? Well, the most interesting feature comes from this skull. This is the skull of Indohyus. You see the teeth here. This is the back of the skull. And this is the ear region. And as you can see here, this bone on this bone, which is one of the ear bones, the tympanic bone, has a very thick bony wall on the inside. And on the outside, you see that bony wall is uh, much thinner. I put next to this a bowhead whale ear. Um, this bone is called the tympanic bone or the bulla. And we saw some sections out of it to show you that the inside of this bone is actually incredibly thick, whereas the outside here is very thin. So even though this, uh, there's no scale here, but this bone is about the size of my fist, this whole skull is just maybe 10 centimeters, much smaller, but they already have this, special, this specialization of the ear bones. You can also plot it, which we did here on the x-axis, basically body size for modern artiodactyls and modern cetaceans. And on the y-axis is the ratio between those two sides of that bone. You see the artiodactyls all have a low ratio for this. The whales have a much higher ratio. And in the highest, even though it's a tiny animal, very small on the x-axis, it has a very thick um, impending bone just like the modern whales. This is not the way you determine phylogeny. You do a cladistic analysis, but this is certainly a very important character that, uh, that, that indicates uh, relationships to whales. Behavior-wise, here you see a cross-section of one of the limb bones of Indohyus, the femur. Um, it's pretty colorless because we use polarized light. Um, the bone is this these bluish and purplish color, the marrow cavity is black, and actually this bone is incredibly thick. Usually the marrow cavity in mammals is much thinner. You really only find these very thick bones in aquatic animals, and they're used for ballast. Hippos, for instance, have very heavy bones because they walk at the bottom of rivers and they need the heavy ballast to keep them so that they don't float up. We also looked at stable isotopes. Um, and so this is a, uh, the stable isotopes of oxygen 18 and oxygen 16. Um, I don't need to go into this much, except to tell you that on this axis, the oxygen axis, it separates low, lower values um, on the, that axis indicate aquatic life. So if we look at the terrestrial mammals from this fauna in the EUC of India, terrestrial mammals are here, the whales um, that we have from there are lower, and Indohyus is even lower than that. So the stable isotopes appear to indicate some aquatic life, even though, as you saw the picture before, it didn't look like a very aquatic animal. So what's going on? Here is a um, African mouse deer, genus Hyamoluscus, modern, um, and this is actually a pretty good model for what um, into highest looked like. It's not, it, it's, these are artiodactyls, but in is not closely related to this particular artiodactyl, but I think it's a pretty good ecological equivalent. Maybe in your spare time, you could take a look at this video, type in eagle and chevrotain in YouTube, and there is a really cool video of a chevrotain, which is the French word for African mouse deer. And what this chevrotain is doing in the video is walking on the forest floor, eating leaves and flowers. Then an eagle flies over and the chevrotain jumps in the water 
and stays on the water till the danger has passed. Occasionally he comes up with his nose to just breathe. And that's exactly what we think might be the case with Indohias, that the initial steps of this land animal to go into the water, into the fresh water, was related to predator escape. We know what Indohias ate. It did not eat water plants, it ate land plants. Um, but that's, that's what we're thinking, that the aquatic adaptations that we do see in the thick bones are related to living close to water because of uh, predator issues. So here's our reconstruction made by uh, Carl Buell in 2007. All right, Act two in our play is three genera of cetaceans from uh, India and Pakistan. So this animal is about the size of a wolf and kind of looks like a wolf with a funny long nose. Uh, 49 million years old, and that's the middle of you see. And here, for the first time, we found one of these bones that indicated uh, th that are diagnostic of artiodactyls in the modern. And sure enough, these whales, Pecocetids, had a double trochleated astragalus. They had this pulley on the underside of this bone, just like the artiodactyl. So this finding really knocked the socks out of our the, the paleontological idea that um, that that whales might be related to mesonicids uh, because mesonicids do not have this building. Mesonicids have an astragalus that looks more like any other land mammal, such as this dog. Okay, so the molecular biologists are right. Whales are related to land artiodactyls. Okay, I showed you in the highs, I showed you Bacchocetids. Let's move on to three, four, and five. Now, let me first show you a few differences between Indohias and Pachycetes, because they are kind of interesting. So this is a dorsal, this is a top view of the skull. You see the socket here for the eyes, and they look up pretty sideways. Here you see in this whale, the eyes are sort of pinched on top of the head. That is common for animals that live in water that want to look at things above the water. Um, and so that's a difference between this guy and this one. This animal is much, much more terrestrial. Also, I'm saying that it's common for animals that live in the water if they want to look at things outside of the water, such as crocodiles or hippos. Um, if you become really a quadrographer, this character is, not, is lost and the eyes go back towards the side of the head. Also real different in this space here. This is the space through which one of the chewing muscles goes, the temporal muscle. And you see that in our fossil whale, that space here is much bigger, suggesting that this animal, the first whale, Pachycetus, had much bigger chewing muscles. We think that there's a big ecological difference between these two. This was a plant eater, as the stable isotope showed us, it ate land plants. This was a meat eater, they become carnivores. As far as limb bones, I showed you this image before in color with the thick wall, unlike other artiodactyls that have a thin wall of their limb bones, a land artiodactyl. So this is an aquatic feature in Indohias, both in the hind limb and the forelimb here. But now look at this fossil whale, an incredibly thick, uh, bone, incredibly thick bone in this forelimb bone, even worse than in the Ohio. So certainly another suggestion that this was a pretty aquatic animal. From the rocks that we find them in, we know the environment was sort of like this, a dry climate, and it was a rainy season with flash floods, and then these ephemeral freshwater bodies, and that's in these rocks. In rocks found in these ephemeral water bodies is where we find the whales. And we think they were, they maybe lived like crocodiles in this water, hunting animals that come to, land animals that come to drink there or maybe catching fresh water fish in the shallows. Okay, at three. There's Pachycetus that I just talked about. Ambulocetus is a lot bigger, also only known from Pakistan and India. Um, and 
you can already see that the proportions are changing. These limbs are getting proportionally much shorter than those of Pachycetus. Also, the environment is different. Where we find Amulocetus, there are lots of marine clams and um, snails. So this was a coastal swamp and marshes area that we find these in. And our ecological interpretation is that they lived in these, uh, in these coastal areas um, and maybe also lived in sort of this crocodile-like fashion. But different from the pachycetes that I talked before, these act two animals, these, this animal, act three, was much more, or clearly lived in water that was uh, brackish to seawater. Okay, act four, Remington acetates. Um, these are different, so now we moved on. Um, well, my field areas where I find these are actually in India, about 42 million years old. These guys have really long, narrow snouts, as you see here. And if you look at, this is a skull with the nasal opening way on the front. You see this tiny little eye here, as this eye is about the size of a marble. Um, they are best known from India. In Pakistan, there's a couple of fossils where you go that these guys uh, from Egypt, as well as from the east coast of the US, where it's just isolated teeth, and you go, boy, that looks like a Remington acetate tooth, but not very strong evidence. The rocks that these guys are found on suggest that the environment was a very muddy um, marine environment. So that makes sense with the small eyes. There wasn't much you see in this dirty water. They also tend to have very, no, not tend to have, they have very large ears. So this suggests that hearing was a more important sense organ than vision. Long narrow snout. Their teeth are sort of undersized, and as I said, the eyes are small. They're close together, and as you can see on this top view here, they're also facing upwards. This is, I think, the this is the ecological model that we have for them. This is a gharial, uh, narrow-snouted crocodile that is a fish eater. So here, we've gone away from this very powerful jawed predatory uh, animal like the act two. Act two and three animals to these guys that are probably fish eaters. They might have heads like gharials. Their uh, bodies were not like gharials. Here you see a um, plot of all the vertebrae from the neck to the tail. And this plots the length of these vertebrae. And you see that the tail vertebrae, which is everything behind this line, are much bigger than any of the other vertebrae. These animals had a very long and powerful tail. And from the shape of those vertebrae, we can tell that the tail was sort of flattened. Uh, this might be an animal you know. This is a South American otter, giant South American freshwater otter, Tiranura, which also has a flattened tail. So I think in, a, in its hind limb, in its body shape, Remitonocetids look quite a bit like these otters. Um, here you see one of the better skeletons of it. Uh, these are the vertebrae, there's the sacrum, and this is the tail, long tail. And if you take two of these tail vertebrae here, this is the humerus, you see they're the same length as the humerus. So this guy had very short limbs, but a very long and powerful tail. For these, we never found the front, the hand and the foot. That's why they're stippled here. Um, so I asked my, uh, by, uh, the person who illustrated this, Carl Buell, here's his self-portrait, um, to draw this animal. But I said, Carl, I don't want you to make up the hands and feet because we don't find, we didn't find those. What am I going to do? What are you going to do to illustrate this animal to make a reconstruction of it? And Carl said, I'll figure something out. And I, he didn't want to tell me, but then he delivered this great uh, solution. He put the animal in the water, um, so we don't know, we don't see what its hands and feet look like, but you do see nicely this long narrow snout and the flattened tail, and then he put the shorebird in to indicate, to show us that this is actually a pretty small animal, not much smaller than, um, than, um, than Amulcetus. So their habitat was a tidally influenced 
uh, protected nearshore marine, maybe like the Outer Banks in North Carolina, if you're familiar with um, with, um, with, with American uh, uh, landscapes. So I really like this animal. So for my book, The Walking Whales, I wanted this to be the cover to Gucci Cetus, these are remnants of Cetus, seen from the top in the muddy water with these beautiful green plants. However, the press decided that this was, they didn't like the dirty water that this animal was living in. So the real cover is unfortunately different. Okay, we're on to act five, the protocetids. And I just, I listed here, five genera of protocetids that are known from uh, the old world. These four are Asian protocetids, is Egyptian. But these guys are actually known from all over the world, even as far as uh, North America. And a, a very beautiful specimen of these was found last year, well, 2019, in Peru. So these were apparently, by now, cetaceans have learned to swim and cross bigger oceans, whereas none of those previous ones were very good swimmers and they all stayed in, um, in, 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 um, in the Pakistan region. So protocetids are younger, 45 to 37 million years ago, known from all these different places. And this is a picture, this is a drawing of a skeleton from Pakistan uh, of an animal called Maya cetus. Um, lots of cool little evolutionary details. So these are top views of the skull of our different uh, acts that I have here. And then I put in two uh, odontocetes and two mysticetes. And you see that the two modern animals, this beaked whale here and the blue whale here, have a blowhole way far back on top of the head. But as you go back, the blowhole is further in the front, and then as you go all the way back into the early you've seen that I showed you here, you see the nasal opening is way in the front, but it slowly is shifting back as these blue bones, the nasal bones get shorter and shorter and eventually end up being barely visible. So there's a really nice transition for those various features. Good reconstruction here of my acetus, uh, much stronger tail and shorter limbs, uh, clearly an uh, aquatically adapted animal um, with strong jaws and big jaws and big eyes. These are always found in, well, not always, they're usually found in rocks that indicate that it was, a, that it was very clear water. Interestingly, in India, we find skulls of these occasionally in these muddy backwater bays where Remington Ocetids are, um, and I might uh, propose that it, the mo a modern analog for what this guy liked to eat is, is that this, these were the killer whales of the uh, EU seed and that they were eating these smaller and fish, these smaller fish eating cetaceans like the Remington Cetus. And here is its reconstruction, also um, the one that uh, Phil Gingrich made. We think that these are. I wrote down sea, sea lion like, I know this doesn't look like a sea lion, but that's uh, in terms of um, habitat more. These animals live mostly in the ocean. Occasionally, they must have come on land to, um, um, for some functions yet. There's quite a bit of controversy about this tail, whether this, these animals had flukes or not. None of the earlier ones had flukes, but here, well, for most of the genera of protocetus that we have, we don't have all the tail vertebrae, so we can't tell. Some people think that some of the genera have a fluke and others uh, do not, but uh, it's not very clear. Okay, and then we get back to basilosaurids, um, the ones that I've talked about already. So here we have nice complete skeletons, mostly from um, Egypt, but there's also very good fossils of them known from uh, North America. And, and they're also found in Pakistan, but not very complete skeletons. So these head really, uh, the head still looks pretty unmodern whale-like, but their body is stream-like. Um, they had uh, flippers for forelimbs, and they definitely, from the tail vertebrae, you can tell that they had a fluke. They also still had uh, hind limbs that were external to the, to the 
um, that came to the surface and, and there was a little um, foot coming out of the body. These hind limbs were not connected to the vertebral column though, so they were certainly not, um, not weight bearing. Um, and this is the last of the Eocene whales. After this, you get the transition to um, odontocetes and mystocetes. And one thing that's, that you still see very clearly here where the teeth in the front of the jaw, the incisors are very different in shape from the teeth in the back of the jaw, which is common, which is normal in mammals, that is soon hereafter lost. So definitely horizontal tail fluke, flippers were falling short neck and hind limbs that are not involved in swimming. Okay, so here is 8 million years of major morphological change. You start with Act 1 animals, pachycetids, you go to Act 2 animals, ambulocetids that might have lived like crocodiles, the first ones to enter marine environments. You move on to remingtonicetids down here, which just they're swimming to use this long flat tail, moving on to protocetids that were managed to that conquered the world because they were good swimmers, and then on to these basilosaurids in the late Eocene, which really looked like a whale and had a certainly a large fluke and this very streamlined body. Um, so it's kind of interesting. 370 million years ago, life came on land. 50 million years ago, life, some life went back to the water. Very interesting morphological transition, but um, that I think now, it, whereas 15 years ago, it was a very poorly documented evolutionary transition. Now it's one of the best documented evolutionary transition. What the next very interesting uh, subject is in evolutionary research is to, to compare these fossil data with data from other sciences. So here is some of my embryo work. I'm not going to go into it, but here you see a dolphin embryo that still has external hind limbs. And you see a couple of dolphin embryos where you can see the fluke getting more and more fluke-like as you go from this young one, which has basically a rat-like tail, to uh, sort of a diamond-shaped tail, and then and then this later fetus, um, the, the, where the sides of the fluke are growing out. Um, what I'm very interested in is just to compare these 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 different sciences, embryology here, and paleontology, and look for um, the different patterns and how how these all contribute to our understanding of our of the evolution of these animals. Really interesting, I think, is this work on the origin of baleen. Baleen, as you know, is, a, is keratin. It's not uh, the same as teeth. But here you see the pellet of a fetus of a bowhead whale. And so this is backlit. You're looking at the pellet, and you see these, this whole row of bumps here. Those are um, actual teeth. If you do histology on these, these are, these, are, these are actually teeth. They never erupt in a fetus, but they are there. Um, what will happen as this animal develops is that the teeth will disappear and then the baleen will come in. Um, I'm going to skip through this. Um, so that brings us to this next part. I think I showed you before what happened in the Eocene with whale evolution. The next exciting thing to study, I think, is uh, the origin of baleen whales, which in includes the origin of baleen as a tissue, and the origin of echolocation at, um, at, uh, in, in tooth whales. And a lot of uh, different scientists, paleontologists, are working on this, um, and there's some really cool stuff that's going on, but um, that's um, for some other day. So that's it, Uko. All right, I'll be back on here. Thank you, Hans. I'll uh, I'll make you sh just make sure. Yeah, good. You're on sharing the screen. Perfect. Thanks so much. Really appreciate that. It's just uh, actually incredible to see how over time we've 
I think there, your science has sort of filled in these gaps that have existed in the past as evolutionary that we didn't know, and we're just starting to fill up, uh, fill these gaps. It's, that's re quite remarkable. Um, I have a lot of questions here, and there's some interesting ones. So let me just come in and scroll here to see what's, um, yeah, so what is your, so yeah, what is your theory as to why these these mammals return to the return to the water? What what one? I'll let yeah. you. So I think uh, the initial steps had to do with going into the freshwater. Had to do with escaping from predators. We know that these early animals were not uh, they didn't feed in the water. They were land. They they ate on land. So this model of the African mouse deer is is a good one. Then, however, they quickly turn carnivorous, and we know that both because we know what their teeth look like, and, and we've looked at the stable isotopes in those teeth and their carnivore signatures for these pegacetids. The eyes are way on top of the body uh, of the head, suggesting that they're actually looking at stuff outside the water. So that gave us the idea that they're feeding like crocodiles, eating land yep. mammals, well, but from their hiding place in the water, land mammal, mammals that come to drink. Um, but the, the missing step in between, I actually have no idea about how you get from a from an land animal feeder that just occasionally goes into to the water to a uh, an early carnivore. So there's a that's a pretty big transition. Um, so I guess I'm not answering the question, but <laughs> that's what I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, has there been a transitional fossil discovered between Pachycetus and Myocetus that shows the change in the ear bones? I'm not sure. Yeah, the... so that's a pretty technical question. Um, I think there, I think Amulcetus' ear is actually very fascinating. Um, and and is, trans, trans, is transitional, what, what, to say. The ear is a very complex organ with lot, lots of little bones. We don't have all the different bones for all the different species. Um, but hearing is obviously a very important sense organ for, for toothed whales, but also for these early Archeus, for these early Eocene whales. Um, and you can see, I think this whole pattern that I described in the Eocene is one where you see the, the different species experimenting with different ways to locomote, experiment with different ways to feed, experiment, experiment with different ways to hear, and then at the end of the use scene, they've hit on something brilliant. You grow baleen and become a filter feeder, mm -hmm. or you, you echolocate and you become a large object feeder, and then everything, everybody else goes extinct. So yeah. I think this first 10 million years or 7 million years is a, is a period of experimentation with different ways to make a living and different ways to swim and feed, yeah. Yeah, got another question here. Um, <clears throat> are the rayolids a snapshot in evolution with the only group of six genera leading to whales or are there steps within the rayolids that follow a path to whales? Uh, for uh, the, what, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I wish I knew. Um, yeah, there is several genera of rayolids Indo-Hyas is, is, but indo is the only one for which we have skeletons and skulls. Um, so that's a, that's a drawback. Yeah. I, I yeah. actually pulled out the real fossil. I hold it up to the camera. So this is the real fossil of a Rawella from the, can you see that? Pretty neat. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can see that. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I'm, just, I'm looking, at, looking at the ventral side, I assume, or the... Yeah. And so yeah. this is the dorsal side. Yeah. But you see how nicely this ear is, these ears are preserved. If I show you the side of this, you go, whoa, what's happened there? It's totally yeah. flattened because this was actually, these animals lived before the Himalayas were there. So once the two continents collided, this one got crushed and flattened. <laughs> 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 I have a bunch of other ones, fortunately. Yeah, no, that's different from roadkill. No, that's yeah. <laughs> uh, It's the Himalayan kill, not a roadkill. Yeah, exactly, the Himalayan <laughs> roadkill. That's not good. Um, don't look at the time. So yeah, yeah, why did... Um, why did you think early animals were whales and not pinnipeds? Was there, yeah. So what? What? Obviously, I think you already alluded that into your in, in your talk. Of yeah. course, talking about whales, well, some, of right. the ear some of them look remarkably in their in the way they look on the outside, the way they locomoted. 
like uh, seals and sea lions. And I've mm -hmm. actually, in studying the skeletons, I often refer to modern pinnipeds because there we know what morphology leads to which. Um, however, if you do the phylogenetic analyses, it, it's very clear that they're related to artiodactyls and that they're related to whales. And then, and then I showed you the one feature that's sort of a really, well, or two features I showed you that are really, you know, killers. One is that ankle bone, the, the astragalus, which looks like a deer, basically, mm -hmm. uh, in whales, in these early whales. And the other one is that shape of that ear bone, the tympanic, with the big, um, the thick side on the one side. That's not something that, um, th those are very clear cetacean features for these early whales. Yep. Um, so the question here, are there examples of convergent evolution similar to Pacacetes and Protocetes that have been discovered? So I'm not sure what that. And then another question, I'm not sure there was this from the same um, person, when they did lose, lose the clavicle bones, which indeed cetaceans don't have clavicle bones. Is that something that you're... Yeah, so that's kind of interesting because artiodactyls don't have clavicle bones either except one, the very first artiodactyl has a clavicle still, um, but it's lost, it's lost very quickly. It's lost before you get to whales. Um, and these er very early artiodactyls have specializations that are suggestive of running, sort of not, not running like a, you know, running like a, um, um, maybe like a rabbit or so. Mm -hmm. um, not, it's not like they're they're you know cheetahs or something, but yeah. they're only um, they're, they they go up on their toes. They're, they're digitally great. Um, so and that's so these these early specializations that 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 the earliest ancestors of whales had were related to uh, to ungulates, and and they also had a, had little hooves. They didn't have nails like oh, uh, yeah. we did. Yeah. Uh, I'm seeing here, did the KT mass extinction play any part in cetacean evolution because it's vacated aquatic ecological, ecological niches? niches. Right. So. Um, so, yeah, we wouldn't have whales if the dinosaurs hadn't gone extinct. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, so, the, the KT extinction is about uh, at about 70 million. The, what we're talking about is about or 65 million. This is about 50 million. So, it was good that all these these Mesozoic reptiles went extinct because, um, the, yeah, so they, the, the, those, they weren't there anymore. Having said that, the oceans that we find these, these earliest whales in that, that, are, that live in the ocean, Ambulocetids and Protocetids, they're full. Those, you find lots of fossils of crocodiles and sharks. Um, so it's not like there's no predators in the ocean. Um, some shockingly large crocodiles we found. We found a, a head of a crocodile, skull of a crocodile, the size of my desk here. <laughs> so that was not a fun animal. Um, I mean, it was fun to find it, but not very easy <laughs> to dig it up. <laughs> no, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So there was, there was plenty of predators there. Um, that's an interesting question because specifically also for, as an, and as an illustrator, I am very illustrated animal, but what, what's, because when you're trying to reconstruct animals, yeah, yeah. yeah, trying to reconstruct animals, I'm thinking about Carl Buell, and he's a phenomenal uh, illustrator. And and because you have to recreate something that isn't there, you have and to. I, so I will say I put that in because of you. <laughs> <laughs> that is hard. I mean, it's it's hard enough to even to draw the extant whales, the ones we now. Um, but I see this this question here. Uh, so yeah, when when did we get a sense when these flukes would, uh, when flukes emerge and when they have these tails would flatten. Of course, we see in, you talk about otters, you see there even a flattening a little bit of a, of a tail. But, there, yeah, there and, the vertebrae got flattened. So flukes, are, animals with flukes, so this includes cetaceans, but also dugongs, right. have a change in proportion of vertebrae about I don't know, maybe 10 vertebrae from the last vertebrae. Yeah, the caudal, the caudal, for, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the proportion, the, the height width proportions of the vertebrae change just briefly. And that's right the point where the main point of flexion of the fluke is. Yeah. So that's where that comes from. Uh, but the trouble is you do need to find those vertebrae. And for a lot of protocytes, we actually don't have a tail. Nah. I mean, it must have had a tail, but it was never found. It never found. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Big puzzle. Um, Probably one more question here, I think. 
uh, is there a species that might be considered for sequencing approaches beyond the genomes to characterize cell types and development gene expression and compare to other animals? So, yeah, have you any genetic work that's been done actually on, is that even possible or? Um, they're doing all kinds of interesting stuff with dinosaurs now that are older than, than so we've talked about it. I do a fair bit of, of, protein expression work on embryos of cetaceans. So that yeah. it, it, it helps that way to think to think about it because I think actually the key to understanding why some features in the fossil record evolve simultaneously, they might be underlain by the same gene, right? Yeah. Um, so that's why I'm very interested in, in, in looking at that in modern cetaceans, um, but We've not tried to do any molecular work on the fossils. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm sure for some of the fossils, it wouldn't work, but for some of them, it might work. From the rocks, mm -hmm. you can tell whether there's, there's organic material preserved. Yep. Um, yep. So possible. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, I love also the embryo the, the, the embryology. Though. That work has been looking at fetuses, and yeah. I'm thinking back on the works. I have a couple of books on, on works from Kuchenthal and, and Goldberg, yeah. those people that had already looked at these hindlimb um, uh, butts. Uh, yeah. Of course, they were ardent, uh, art Darwinists, though they really looked at, at these um, at these changes from a, from a, an evolutionary standpoint. So it was very interesting. So that's, uh, yeah. that's incredible how you brought us to, to all together. So I'm thinking, I'm um, not sure if there's anything other question here than I've popped here. I think we've gotten to address most of those. So with that, Hans, I'm going to thank you so much yeah. for, for being yeah. here. My I would absolutely and I'll uh, encourage people to get uh, that uh, Walking Whales it's a phenomenal book as it's easy to read it's wonderful to read and uh, it it really gives you uh, very much what much of what you've talked about today it gives you really succinct kind of a, a good right. overview of where we are at this point a good a snapshot of our current knowledge is perfect so